The contrast of 1880 and the present is becoming a common sight. The problems of our cities are real, however, because of the heavy hand of old-fashioned design. It affects residential property. Much of our industrial space presents a special problem with old multi-story buildings. Substantial and ornate buildings are to be found everywhere. The truly dynamic American cities are those that are coming to grips with the problem of outmoded structures. In this jet age, events move fast, faster indeed than we sometimes realize. So we're using this word abandoned because it's been abandoned by industry but, and commercialism and capitalism, but people haven't abandoned it. If, if anything, we've used it more. Surely obsolescence should not cause despair. It is one of the results of America's rapid growth. always lived in Philadelphia and I noticed even when I was taking pictures, looking at pictures from high school, I was photographing buildings. I've always been attracted to buildings. Um, and then the abandoned spaces came uh, in the early 90s and it sort of dovetails with a period in Philadelphia where it's uh, the economy, the state of the city was so bad. The people who lived in the city were just diehard urban people. They just wouldn't live in any other context. Urban life is critical to the culture of any nation. And I believe our country has suffered dearly due to the um, disinvestment of its cities and the de-urbanization that happened over the last 50, 60 years. And I think we are conscious of that as a, as a country. And when I moved back to Philadelphia, um, the city was uh, falling down and there were abandoned buildings everywhere. The buildings had this potential, which in Europe I rarely saw vacant or abandoned buildings. I came back to Philadelphia and I saw all these abandoned buildings and all the homeless. Uh, just the paradox was very strong and so I wanted to photograph the city um, for reasons to, to, to know what happened to Philadelphia. I didn't know what happened to Philadelphia. Historically speaking, Philadelphia hit its peak population in the 1950s. At that point, most of the neighborhoods that are now within the boundary of Philadelphia were densely occupied. There wasn't a lot of vacant land within the city limits. Through uh, a series of what I think most people agree now uh, were a regrettable set of policy decisions made by the city and by the state that subsidized suburban growth. There was an exodus of white middle class people from the city of Philadelphia. You know, the Great Migration is really important and plays into that. And the, I feel that the United States uh, dealt with the Great Migration in a very quiet way. They, they ghettoized the cities and they moved the white population uh, and the European immigrants to the suburbs. And if you look at North Philadelphia or a lot, most of the, the central area of the city, and I mean central, like most of the city, you'll see that there's no residential buildings really built after 1938, 1940. Uh, there's a reason for that. There was a federal policy uh, which decided during the, the uh, Roosevelt administration in the 30s, during the housing crisis of the Depression, to basically develop a redlining system and it equated black residents with blight, no matter what the conditions of the buildings. Um, and it set the stage for segregation. So I, I think uh, history is incredibly important for people to understand. We don't know where we're going unless we know our history. I think history needs to be preserved. Um, and there's something about living history through buildings that help uh, keep it in people's memories. Well, I grew up in Philly, and I feel like any kid, no matter where you grow up, you sort of explore your environment. And if you grow up maybe in the suburbs, that might be a nice hiking trail or a big park or even the beach. But um, because I grew up here, I always was exploring abandoned spaces from really as young as I can remember. I mean, they're all sort of around us. I grew up in Fishtown in the 90s, so, you know, at the end of the block, there's a warehouse that's abandoned. 
Um, I think Graffiti Pier is another place like that. It's, it's open to the public, or it's an open space, but it's privately owned. If you look at the hashtag, there's more hashtags with Graffiti Pier than there are Race Street Pier, or it's very similar, I always forget. They kind of butt each other. So this Race Street Pier thing, the thing that costs uh, you know, millions of dollars to create and build, and is beautiful, and I think our city should have as well, is attracting just as much interest, at least on Instagram, as this thing that's been left abandoned by industry and that the city, you know, arrest people when they find them in there. So, I mean, if you've ever been there in the summer, there's people jumping in the river and like sunbathing. Um, but also as a, as a tourism asset, I mean, graffiti is nostalgic now. People want to come to cities like Philadelphia and I get emails all the time, what neighborhoods they go to to find murals and graffiti and street art. So everyone's trying to get a shot that no one else has. Um, and you're rewarded in that sense that you oftentimes get more likes if you take a shot of something that no one, or an angle or a thing that no one else will be able to shoot. Um, and very few people are going into abandoned spaces. So right. if you are interested in doing it and you have the will to do it, you'll be rewarded usually on Instagram right. with likes. Here you can, you can meet people because you'll, you'll find people here on a Sunday afternoon. Uh, I, I've met a few people here because it's right out in the open. And it's also, they're not likely to get uh, thrown in jail if they're caught painting here because the place is painted to death. But you get into, into some of the buildings where trespassing is, uh, you know, an issue. I, you just don't see them. And uh, they seem to know each other, but <laughs> I haven't been able to like, locate them. But they, uh, I love some of the work they do. It's like anything else. Some of them are very good and some of them should find something else. Uh, you know, they need a new hobby, but you know, it's, it's paint on the walls and for, for my purposes, it's fine. We go through here and, and this place is particularly fascinating because you have these two doors and paint all over. You have paint inside there, paint in this building. And again, I'm in the same place, same lens, same height, and I do that. Come on, there's some more light out this way. This place is, uh, uh, I think it's more of a problem for the city because it has gotten more and more popular. And when I first started coming here, and it was only like five, six years ago, you didn't have paint all the way up there. You just had a few uh, things painted on there. I mean, this has been painted over so many times. If you look at that panel on the left, you can see a huge yellow cat, cat face there. See how that's been, that, see that orange uh, 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 block uh, on the right hand side down at the bottom that's got green over it now. Uh, two months ago there was uh, uh, there was a group of people there and they had painted, I forget her name, Eileen will you marry me and uh, uh, and there was they, there it was a party I mean they, they, there, there must have been 30 people here waiting for Eileen and the boyfriend to show up uh, and I hung around for a while but I don't know whether she said yes or not but that that was going on at the time. Some people are drawn to them uh, because uh, the same reasons that I am, and some find it uh, you know a fun place to get stoned and you know play play games and have sex and do whatever they do because it's out of the uh, you know it's out of the eyeballs of uh, civilized society in some cases. I mean you come down here and act like a real jerk. You know? On the one hand, it would seem irresponsible to make an argument that would condone illicit activities in public spaces, but I'm also aware that those activities have always been part of public spaces and that I am personally suspicious of a tendency towards greater surveillance in our public spaces. I think that people in a free city should be free to express, express themselves and conduct themselves as they see fit without too much surveillance or too much scrutiny of their actions and their motives. I'm not naive about the problems of crime in any large city and I don't want to sound like I'm deaf to those concerns. It's just that I'm equally concerned about liberty. I would hate to see that be bought or sold by private industry and then turned into a big condo pier. I mean, I think that would be such a disservice to the city and to the artists that have sort of over the last 10, 20 years turned that into such a mecca. Every city is always changing and there's always things falling apart and development coming in. And um, I have really mixed feelings and I think that it's, it's really hard to 
know how to manage the maintaining of historical presences while also meeting the needs of current populations. I, I guess one thing that was interesting to me, and it's always interesting in Philadelphia, is there's a wiping out of the current existence in order to create what is imagined to be better. And that included families either being moved out or in this case there were homeless families or homeless people that were forced out of abandoned buildings. And um, it, it's not that that was so compelling. It, it just had to do with the layers. So I think it was really about the layers that was new to me. The reason I like to focus on the decay, it sounds, sometimes it sounds so easy, but really for me, there's two pieces. The biggest piece is that for, it reflects the people that have been there before. I see whether it's the side of a building or recycling bits, the decay is representative of humanity existing there, of people living their lives. And sometimes it's the only thing that's left. And that is the point of it for me is um, I'm compelled by something. I'm really drawn to these walls. Um, I'm drawn to the evolution in Philadelphia and other cities as well. And the reason for me to share it and show it is so that other people will also be thinking about some of those things, same things in their own ways, but also be thinking about, okay, this isn't just about decay and uh, poverty and, and falling apart neighborhoods. This is also about people's lives and what, uh, how things originated and how things change over time. I, I think for me, it's when things are falling down, then there's probably good reason to look at raising and other development. When things are solid and could be kept and worked from there, I think that that should be the first consideration. I guess it goes back to my archives work. Preservation should be the first consideration, and if that's impossible, then you look at the other alternatives. strong believer that uh, a developed divine lane is a lot better for the neighborhood than an undeveloped one. The divine rain has always pulled at our heartstrings uh, and the owner Eric Blumenfeld always felt like something was missing uh, I think both personally and business-wise and it was the divine rain and when he had the opportunity to purchase it back a few years ago he jumped at it and kind of, this is where we are today. So the history of the Divine Lorraine is an interesting one. Um, the building's been here since the late 1890s, and over the last 100 plus years, it's taken on many different lives. It's been a, an apartment building, it's been a hotel, it's been a, uh, a place for the International Peace Mission, which, um, you know, everybody knows about Father Divine and his role in Philadelphia and New York. Um, being a, uh, a man of God, and uh, they vacated the property in 1999, which many people don't know. During Prohibition, where you're standing now was an old speakeasy, and over there um, was the staircase to come down and enjoy some refreshments. It's since been bricked over, but that leads directly to Broad Street. This is a gateway to Center City and north to Temple and beyond into the suburbs. And the Divine Lorraine really is a linchpin. It's at the corner of Main and Main. Um, it sits, this hulking, massive building right on North Broad Street, a really untapped uh, potential that we just couldn't let go. Uh, chopping up this old hotel, making it 101 apartments, that was the difficult part. But I say that, but on the same token, it's been a really fun and enlightening process too, and, and an education for us too. We inherited a lot of broken off statues and, and pieces of um, basically the whole building, but uh, painstakingly these, these, these artists, these craftsmen have been kind of going back in time, looking at photos, understanding what 
you know, they were made of and, and redoing them to how they should be done. The lobby's taken the most time just because of the nature of how much work it needed, but also how great it was done originally, and we're trying to bring that back and, you know, create the same space. The finished product will be uh, what I like to call a hybrid, uh, in the sense that it'll be mixed use of commercial space on the first and uh, lower level, uh, and as you rise up in the building, you'll have about 79 apartments and approximately 25 hotel rooms. So the finished package, we did some really nice, interesting finishes with uh, casework and cabinetry and some, you know, old school funky lighting in the hallways, and it feels like, you know, a historic hotel, um, but it's an extended stay for the people who'll be living here. Uh, you know, we really wanted this building to take off a while ago, but there are just certain things that um, mm -hmm. have to play out. I think the overall uh, reception has been positive. There are some, you know, negatives that, you know, uh, this stands for something that, you know, might not cater to all people. Uh, but overall, I think the neighborhood has embraced it. Uh, you know, it's never fun to live through construction, but right now I think, you know, we're on the tail end, so uh, the reception is getting better. So one of the biggest challenges of this project is to keep the character of what's there and keep the historical nature of what's there. So we're taking an old site and retaining some of its history and also adding on layers of forward thinking to it. And that's a delicate balance. There are many urban explorers that would like us to leave the site alone and let them run on it illegally trespassing and enjoy that experience of wow, you know, sense of discovery. We want to preserve as much of that as possible, but still create a public space that invites everyone. Right now, the viaduct is not safe to walk on. There are sections of the viaduct that you could fall through to, to the street. It's quite dangerous. But the site was built to transport tons and tons of freight and locomotives. So there's an inherent structural quality that far exceeds the requirements for pedestrians. The reason this site exists is because in the late 19th century, Reading Railroad had 12 tracks crossing Broad Street right here near Callow Hill at street level. So imagine these massive steaming, smoking locomotives hundreds of freight cars, two directions, 12 tracks, crossing our main street. And the city said, we need you to get your trains off the streets. So they created this suppressed section, the cut in the tunnel, and then they created this elevated section, the viaduct, to get the trains out of interacting with the automobiles that were coming and the pedestrians and the horses and buggies and carts. Reading's engineers had to calculate how do we get trains from 25 feet below street level to 25 feet above street level? They did all their calculations, they built it, it worked, it's here today. And one of the magic moments of this project is learning that the grade that they ended up choosing is exactly the same grade as ADA requirements for uh, the American Disabilities Act uh, so that people of all different accessibilities can walk up into the site and enjoy it. The majority of the site was a freight line that was used initially to bring coal into Philadelphia, not just to fuel the homes uh, of the expanding city in the uh, late 19th century into the early 20th century, but it also was the coal that powered the Industrial Revolution up and down the eastern seaboard. We had a major coal port in Port Richmond, which was a distribution center. The freight line was last ran in 1994 when it was bringing newsprint to the Inquirer building, and the site has been abandoned since then. Next to me is a former Reading Railroad diner car built in the 1920s. 
that's sitting on a site of an abandoned line called the Willow Run, which ran at street level from here to both rivers. And our organization is in conversations with Conrail and the city of Philadelphia about acquiring this rail car to use as a visitor center, as a headquarters for the rail park, as a programming space to engage communities from all around the city and to create partnerships with other organizations to engage in programming. There's many neighborhood residents that see the viaduct as an eyesore. Uh, it's not attractive. It's a rusting carcass of steel. So there was a lot of interest in getting removing this blight. But the people that created the vision to turn it into a public space were able to see it for the historic nature that it is, acknowledge the history that comes with it, and also see the possibilities for how it could create a new type of public space in Philadelphia. In the United States, we have a tendency here to turn most of our plazas, most of our public spaces, into parks or gardens. They're effective as rural or proxies for wilderness within the city context, and that's a nice feature to have in cities. Early in the Renaissance, public spaces tended to be empty. They were large open areas that were available for a variety of uses, basically whatever use a citizen envisioned for that space. And that tendency has persisted in Europe to a certain degree, you know, the, the value of just a big open space. Communities, you want to have a balance between housing and commercial and open space, and recreational use, you know, arts and culture. There's a whole range of things that make for a healthy community. And so it depends in part on what assets are already there and what is still needed, um, both by existing residents, but what, what makes sense for the city overall. So, you know, again, that's the, one of the key challenges is that as properties are repurposed, as neighborhoods are improved, it's important. We want to attract new investment, new residents, new businesses into communities that have been disinvested in the past. But you have to do it in a mindful way and put policies and strategies in place that will make sure that long-term residents will be able to remain and other residents can call that community home in the future too. And so the challenge really becomes around the vacant property front is how do you actually get control of those properties if you want to repurpose them in a more productive way. We know that Philadelphia used to be a manufacturing giant, um, and when those jobs moved away, uh, a lot of the population moved away, uh, uh, disinvestment started happening in many neighborhoods, and as people did, either didn't have the resources because they no longer had a job to maintain their home, or as they abandoned those properties because they lost value, um, it has sort of a cyclical effect. You get one abandoned house on the street, and then the person next door stops taking care of their property or there's a fire on the street and it impacts a couple properties but since properties weren't worth what they used to be um, there's less of incentive to reinvest money in those communities. For many years Philadelphia was a declining city and we we're trying to figure out how to manage decline. Uh, we've actually turned the corner now and the city has started to grow in its population and so what's really important is the city think about how we align our resources and our strategies to make sure that as the city grows, everyone in Philadelphia benefits, not just the folks that typically would benefit from new investment and new development. So we want to make sure that low-income residents that have lived in disinvested communities over the long term have the opportunity to remain in those communities as they improve and benefit from improved quality of life at the same time have the ability to have mobility choices to live in other communities that maybe have higher opportunities. And so by advocating uh, for policies that advance and resources that advance those approaches and practices, we think we can make a more inclusive Philadelphia that benefits everyone. There just has to be greater aspects of creativity on the, on the, um, uh, the politicians in this, in this town to be able to see the great uh, benefits of having a beautiful city uh, that is a variety of architectural uh, styles. In, in Philadelphia, everywhere, people are very interested in buildings, and so there's an architectural component, but behind all of the architecture is, these were built for a reason. The city can only do so much, and really it's kind of out of their control. I don't know what the answers are, because <laughs> I don't work in yeah, policy, yeah. but there's got to be something they can do. 
My hopes are that we can repurpose public, uh, vacant public and privately owned uh, property in the city. Uh, and that can really be a stimulant to helping the city grow, but to grow in a way that's inclusive for all. Cities are resilient. You know, urbanization has been a trend throughout civilization. And so increased numbers of people living in cities is possible to regard that as an inexorable motion. And so I, I guess that what I'm saying is don't bet against cities.